to others like myself who came from another Christian tradition or for those who came to Christ at a, a later time in life were baptized after making a personal decision to follow the Christ. And there are many forms of baptism that the church accepts. I got to be dunked. So I actually got to walk the plank, I say, because they actually put a, a board uh, to go into the baptistry. For those of you who were at the Baptist church with us the other night, you saw this big light shining in the back. You know, that was actually lighting up the baptistry. And for little people, <laughs> They put a board across the steps going in and the steps going out. And I got to actually walk the plank for Jesus. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to jump in the water. I got to go on to the other side. My mother waited for me with a nice warm towel because I was totally immersed. However, um, it came to me when, my, uh, when I was uh, kind of stepping in the waters of Anglicanism and I saw I was there present for a, a, the baptism of, a, of an infant. And it came to me, you know, baptism works, no matter how much water you have. And so it's not really the forms that matter, what's important. I mean, you can just even have just a little spoon of water. The Holy Spirit is present, whether you're dunked or you just get a little splash on you. I like splashes, as you will find out later. <laughs> when we do the renewal of our baptismal vows. <laughs> and I can't help it, it's just my, my genes, you know, my DNA, so <laughs> it's still there in me. But the thing is, is that baptism marks the beginning of the journey with Christ in our lives. So whether or not that journey begins as an infant, child, or adult, the important thing is to be baptized. Baptism is actually our response to the hope of our calling from Christ. Through the waters of baptism, we enter into Christ's death and resurrection for our sins, and baptism washes away our past, raising us up as new creations in Christ. Baptism is an essential act of obedience to Christ and our testimony to the world of our allegiance to the body of Christ. In his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul writes, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In Jesus' last words to his disciples and followers before he ascended to the Father God, he summed up the mission of the church in what has become known as the Great Commission. How many of y'all are familiar with that term, the Great Commission? Oh, good. <laughs> there are some of us that do know about that. That's really good. <laughs> That's not, Anglicans are not always aware of it, which is really strange because Anglic the Anglican church was foremost in the front and spreading the gospel worldwide. I mean, you know, Paul was really good with the Roman Empire, but then when the Anglican Church came about, we were, the church was spread through the ships. You know, they went all over the world. Wherever the British Empire went, churches were built in the name of Christ. And so it's, so it's really kind of sad when Anglicans don't know the Great Commission because... <laughs> That is one of the big powerful things of the uh, Anglican Church and, and uh, in the British Empire. But in the, uh, in the scriptures, in Christ's final command to the church, Jesus included the importance of baptism right before he's leaving earth. I mean, he's ready to ascend to the Father God. So he wants to get everything to his people, to the followers, and, and put it in a tight nutshell, so to speak, so they'll have it there, what we might call a sound bite. And he wants them to have it so that they will be understanding, this is what you're supposed to do, guys, after I leave. I've spent 40 days and nights telling you what all to do. Now here it is in a nutshell. And Matthew writes, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus' great commission to the church can actually be divided up into three commands. The first is to make disciples. The second is to baptize the disciples. And the third is to teach disciples to observe everything Jesus commanded his followers to do. Well, baptism comes after making disciples in the Great Commission. The church, however, has practiced infant baptism from the beginning. And the reason being that the faith of the believers would uphold the infant's faith until such time as the baptized could confirm his or her faith in Christ at the age of accountability. Well, beginning with the infant's baptism and before the age of accountability, the church agrees in accepting full responsibility in teaching the baptized the traditions and in making the baptized a disciple of Christ. Has anyone not been to a Baptist baptism service? Okay, so then you know that when we're someone's being baptized, you get to participate in stating, I will, I will. Well, those I wills have consequences. And they're not just to say, I will, to make the, the parents and the, I just lost sound here, to make the parents and the godparents and the grandparents all feel good. These are real commitments from the church to uphold the infant in faith and to support that infant, to raise that child up to know Jesus. In the book of Acts, we are given um, several examples of entire households being baptized. And among those examples is the household of Cornelius, a Roman centurion who has been given a special feast day in the book of Common Prayer and the household of the unnamed Philippian jailer for Paul and Silas. It has been accepted by the traditional church that not all who were baptized had yet reached the age of accountability, thus leaving open the possibility for infant baptism. Also, it was a custom at that time for the head of the household to choose the religion for all members of the household, and that includes slaves, servants, whatever. And so if the head of a household became a Christian, then all the members of that household, by mandate, became Christians. Well, this custom actually helped greatly in growing the early church. However, like a you know two-sided sword, it also had the other side where it turned husbands against their wives, children against their parents, and masters against their servants when a member of the household became a Christian in a non-Christian home. And this division of households in the early movement of the church caused non-Christians to even turn over members of their own household to the Roman authorities during times of persecution against the church. And we've seen that happen uh, throughout history. In the communist countries, we saw that happening, and it still happens. And in, um, over in the Middle East, where we have uh, Muslims who are coming to Christ, we still see that happening, great persecution for any Muslim who dares to, be, uh, to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's great persecution, meaning, and to the point of death can happen for that. And so sometimes these believers... Uh, the, who were martyred for Christ, though, had not yet even been baptized by water. And when going back in history, such as the case of Perpetua and her companions, who are also listed as saints in the Book of Common Prayer. And the church accepted the blood of these martyrs for Christ as their baptism into the body of Christ. The word baptism comes from the Greek word meaning immersion. And so it's by their own blood that they gave up everything. For Christ and so uh, because uh, a lot of times they were just you know swept out of their homes taken by brute force and they there was no time for baptism and they found themselves being tortured and killed for Christ so it was the church literally believed that they were literally they literally entered into death for Christ's sake and that they were reborn into eternal life with Christ and this has also happened in the prisons 
in communist prisons and also in prisons where there is great persecution against Christians, where there might not be a place to baptize or there, there might not be a way to do the baptism because everything is being watched. And so, but, but yet the, the, the word of Christ is spreading and people's lives are being changed. And so we have to accept that even though these people who are believers and uh, who are risking their lives in very risky areas, I mean, you know, the very lives are at stake for Christ's sake, that they too, even if they are tortured and, and killed before ever being baptized in water, I truly believe that the Lord receives them into heaven because they are our modern day martyrs. Well, we also have uh, the example of the thief on the cross. Now, he was not, and he was on the cross next to Jesus' cross. Now, he was not up there because <laughs> he was being martyred for Christ. He was up there because he had broken the law. It, he was, and he was not baptized, nor had the opportunity to be baptized. And yet, we believe that he was received by Jesus into the kingdom of God, and from the beginning of Christianity, it was denoted the importance of the confession of Christ as Lord and Savior. And Luke writes, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, meaning Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. We have Jesus' word. I think that's more than enough <laughs> right there. Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist it really is is so exciting about that Jesus submitted himself to baptism and I have preached on that before and and I don't know if you know this but some of my at least two particular sermons I've preached on baptism I've, I really think I should have made them into pamphlets and given the money to the church <laughs> because so many of them are down is is downloaded by the droves and but um so I'm trying to progress here on this. So if you want to hear about Jesus' baptism, my thoughts on that, um, you can look at last year's sermon <laughs> on John the Baptist on our website um, for uh, Jesus' baptism day there. But John the Baptist, when he baptized Jesus, what happened was that we had John the Baptist standing in as the prophet for, you know, telling people that Jesus was here he was the messiah was coming and yet he was still under the old covenant and so scholars see him actually as being the last prophet from the old testament and the fulfillment of the prophets of all the prophets came when jesus not only you know when jesus came and when he submitted to the baptism he was actually saying Okay, Lord, we can, okay, Father, we'll start the mission now. He'd already been on earth for 30 years. He had lived as a man without sin. He had done honor to his parents. He had, he had uh, done well. He had done everything. He had, there was no fault or blame to be found in him. And it was, it was his baptism actually marked the beginning of the new covenant of God for our salvation and revealed to all that Jesus is the light of the world. It's through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River, which I can tell you is a very muddy river. <laughs> People who come out of being baptized in the Jordan River are just covered in mud. <laughs> it's a, I've seen the mud there. It's very muddy. And it's through this uh, submission, this humility of going through this, through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River that Isaiah's prophecy 
that we read earlier of the servant king was fulfilled. As a reminder, I want to read it back to you. Isaiah wrote, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. Now he's speaking here of Jesus the Christ. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Jesus' baptism marked the beginning of his ministry on earth. And our baptism marks the beginning of our relationship in Christ and also our ministry to others on his behalf. My prayer is that we will be diligent and fulfilling our baptismal vows unto the Lord. And now we're going to get to do a renewal of our baptismal vows. Okay. Miss Roxy, I need my 